for the main event. In many ceremonies, the presentation of stoles, hoods, degrees comes last. We close with a charge to our graduates. In order to have graduates to be charged, we have to present those first. President Juan Santos of Colombia will now present the charge to the graduates. President Santos received the Nobel Peace Prize in 2016 for his efforts to end his country's protracted war with the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, or FARC, a Marxist guerrilla organization. President Santos studied economics and business as a cadet at the Naval Academy in Cartagena. He graduated from the University of Kansas in the United States with an undergraduate degree in economics and business administration, pursued graduate studies at the London School of Economics, Harvard University, and the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. As a journalist, he was a columnist and deputy director of the newspaper El Tiempo and was awarded the King of Spain's International Journalism Prize and served as president of the Freedom of Expression Commission for the Inter-American Press Association. He has published several books, including The Third Way, co-written with British Prime Minister Tony Blair. He was Colombia's first foreign trade minister. He's also served as Colombia's finance minister and national defense minister, where he was in charge of implementing the government's democratic security policy. President Santos created the Good Government Foundation and founded the political party Partido de la U, currently Colombia's largest political party in 2005. <clears throat> President Santos was first elected president of the Republic of Colombia in 2010, receiving more than 9 million votes, the highest total obtained by any candidate in the history of Colombian democracy. In 2014, he was re-elected to a second four-year term. Like so many of you in our audience today, he is also a deeply loving and committed parent. The initial agreement between the government and the FARC was reached on Wednesday August 24, the day after school resumed this fall. Esteban Santos, one of our graduates today, called his dad and said, I want to hear all about it. His father replied, no, you're my son. You just started your last year at UVA. Before I tell you my news, I want to hear about your first day back at school. President Santos. Dear Dean Stan, members of the Baton School faculty and administration, dear 2017 graduates, family members, and guests. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Frank Batten for his generosity and vision, without which none of us would be here today celebrating this magnificent graduation, graduation ceremony at this uh, world-class institution. Frank Batten was certainly right when he decided that good leaders and good policymakers are essential for the well-being and progress of any nation. They create a framework within which each citizen can flourish or fail. Whether we are doctors or business people, plumbers, soldiers, or rock stars. Sound leadership and good public policy are necessary conditions for a better future, not only for young people such as yourselves who are launching your professional careers now, but also for the next generations, your children and your children's children. I would also like to thank you for inviting me, giving me this great honor to be your commencement speaker. When I was first invited, 
the Wahoos and the Jayhawks were advancing toward the NCAA <laughs> basketball finals. As a Jayhawk, I would have loved to see our two teams meet in the finals. And of course, being your guest, I will refrain from speculating about who would have won. <laughs> Maybe next year. And Dean, uh, Dean San, uh, I think I speak on behalf of every father and mother here present and the ones who are not present. When I thank you and the members of the faculty for what you've done for our sons and daughters. There is nothing more important for a father or a mother to, than leaving a good education to our sons or daughters. And you have been a very important part in contributing to uh, this legacy that we leave our sons and daughters. I don't know if I am here today as a, this year's uh, Nobel Peace Laureate, as the President of Colombia, a proud strategic ally of the United States, or simply as the father of one of today's graduates, my youngest son, Esteban. I prefer the latter role because I know that every father and mother here today feels what I feel, an enormous sense of joy and pride to see our sons and daughters graduate from one of the best universities in the world, and especially from the, Bra the Frank Batten School of Leadership and Public Policy. Over its short story, this school has positioned itself as a rich incubator of knowledge and wisdom, best practices, and of talented and capable leaders. Today, I would like to share a few reflections about leadership drawn from, from my own personal experience. Leadership is a word full of meaning, yet often misunderstood. Leadership is not a natural gift. It is a, acquired through experience, and it comes in different forms, and, like power, it can be exercised in very different ways. As president, I have learned, for example, that the type of leadership needed to be successful in waging war is very different from the one necessary to make peace. I've had the opportunity to exercise both, and each teaches, teaches us uh, profoundly different lessons. Leadership in war, I have found, is in many ways easier, simpler, more straightforward. As I told you yesterday during the commencement speech, I served uh, as a Marine in the Colombian Navy. My son Esteban served as a soldier in the Colombian Army. We were taught discipline and to follow orders. You simply don't question orders because that may cost lives in the middle of a battle. At least that's what our petty officers told us. Of course, a good military leader must know about strategy and tactics and about many other things. But that type of leadership is uh, hierarchical, vertical, more or less black and white. In times of war, you must rally the forces behind you, not only the military, which of course is vital, but more importantly, public opinion. You do so by saying, we are the good guys. The enemies are the bad guys, so let's go fight them and let's win. But I have news for you. Life is not black and white. Life is not a Star Wars movie where you have to choose between the light or dark side of the force. <laughs> there are many, many sides, and in the end, we are all humans seeking our destinies with different perspectives, different interests, and different beliefs. So to be a good leader, you have to understand the many shades of gray that lie between black and white. 
In my case as Minister of Defense, I was considered a very successful leader in times of war. That's how I came to be elected president with the largest number of votes in the Colombian history. Achieving military superiority was a necessary condition to bring the enemy to the negotiating table and then to negotiate from a position of strength. Paradoxically, as history shows, waging war is often necessary to achieve peace. As president, I decided to start negotiations with the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, known as FARC, the oldest and most powerful guerrilla group in Latin America, who were responsible for all kinds of terrible crimes. I was warned that Colombians would not understand such an approach and that the simple fact of sitting down with the FARC face to face would cost me dearly. If negotiations advanced, any concession to this guerrilla group would cost me even more. And let me tell you, it did. Even so, I firmly believe that the change in strategy was the correct path to take. And more important, I believe it was the right thing to do. This is one of the main lessons I would like to leave with you today. It is ideal to do what is both popular and correct, but often this will be simply impossible. This is where character and leadership come in. These are the moments when you should listen to your inner voice, as I mentioned yesterday, because it will tell you to choose what is right over what is popular. This is easy advice to give, of course, but often difficult, very difficult, to actually carry out. Ask yourselves if you are ready for this to be your guiding principle in life. Do what is right, what is correct, no matter how unpopular. If you do, you will surely suffer some consequences, but you will achieve something very, very important peace of mind. As Minister of Defense and as Commander-in-Chief of our Armed Forces, I had to send many young soldiers, most of them your age, into lethal danger. Many went to their graves fighting for a better future for our country. Others returned with disabilities for life. That's why I asked myself the crucial question. How could I feel at the end of my life if I had had the opportunity to end the war and stop the bloodshed and I hadn't taken it? I probably would have never, never forgiven myself. And here is another lesson that I first learned from my grandfather. It is OK to regret what you have done or at least try to do. But do not go through life feeling sorry for what you could have done and you didn't do. That type of sorrow is usually very bitter. Soon I realized, I realized that making peace requires a very different type of leadership. It is much more difficult than waging war. Why? What I, have, what I have discovered is that in a war, a leader can use primal sentiments such as fear, hatred, or revenge, which are very strongly rooted in people and are easily manipulated. To make peace, however, you need to transform those sentiments into their very opposites, reconciliation, forgiveness, tolerance, or even love. And that is much more difficult because you have to convince people to change their attitudes, their feelings, their perceptions. 
For a moment, I ask you to put yourselves in the shoes of one of the more than eight million victims that my country's war has left behind. Imagine that your father or mother or your brother or sister had been killed or raped. Immediately and naturally and understandably, the negative sentiments take over. Hate and revenge are unfortunately part of the human condition. And imagine after going through that trauma, some political leader tells you that you should look to the future, leave the war behind, forget about revenge, change your attitudes. Imagine that he tells you that instead, instead of hating the perpetrators of such crimes who caused you so much pain, you should make peace and begin to reconcile, even shake hands, forgive if not forget, and where possible, work together to reconstruct your country after so much violence and destruction. Not easy, not easy at all. This is why a peace process is so much more complex. But I learned another lesson. I thought the victims would be the most bitter opponents of a negotiated solution. I was wrong. They became my best allies. So don't let yourselves be driven by first impressions. It's better, always better, not to prejudge. Another important obstacle to peace was, uh, to the peace process, was raised by Machiavelli when he warned the prince to be aware of change. On the one hand, the majority who benefit from change tend to remain silent, whereas the mi minority who are negatively affected rise up in noisy protest. And on the other hand, when you are not sure what change will lead to, we tend to reject it. We feel more secure with what we have, even if it is not as good, than we do with the unknown or the unexpected. This was for me one of the, one of the great paradoxes. Colombians had lived with an armed conflict for so long that we had become insensitive. We lived in such extreme conditions that we were losing our, com our compassion, uh, our capacity to feel the pain of others. Many, many were afraid of peace. Can you imagine being afraid of peace? It seems unthinkable, but it happened in my country especially for people who lived in the cities where, who had not suffered directly the consequences of the war. So we had to negotiate a peace in Colombia in the face of a tremendous emotional and mental obstacle, the fear of peace. Fear is a powerful force, and frankly, we underestimated it. That's why when we put the peace agreement to a popular referendum. The no votes won over the yes votes, even by a tiny margin. The same had happened a few months before with the Brexit vote in the UK. We are seeing around the world fear driving our choices in the voting booth. But fear, my dear graduates, is never a good companion or a wise counselor. I'm not going to repeat the story I told you yesterday. You already know the happy ending. We eventually achieved a new agreement with the FARC, and today we are building peace in our country. And I reaffirmed another lesson on this bumpy journey. Good public policy is not always what people want but rather what is good for them. They are not necessarily the same. And the trick for the leader is to know this difference with humility. This is where leaders should spend 
or rather invest their political capital in the things that really matter, in making peace and uniting people around a greater good, in promoting tolerance and inclusion in a world that is deeply polarized and becoming dangerously violent, in defeating fear, discrimination, and hate, and delivering a message, a message of love, compassion, and respect for the others. In Colombia, as days and months go by without headlines of bombings or attacks, people are gradually learning to live without war. Many still criticize the peace agreement. There's never a perfect peace agreement. But the debate is shifting in favor of peace. The arguments and reality are finally winning over the negative emotions. Going back to war has simply become unthinkable. When I look out uh, at my country today, this is what I see along with my fellow Colombians. Countless lives have been saved. The terrible machinery of manufacturing victims and endless pain is shutting down. And a booming country is beginning to seize its moment of hope. History will be the final judge. But meanwhile, I have peace of mind. So my dear graduating students, let me conclude my remarks here with a few words to the wise. Your generation finds itself at a great crossroads. These are times of uncertainty and peril. The forces of uh, xenophobia, discrimination, and prejudice loom like dark clouds on the horizon. This must be confronted with knowledge, like the one you acquired in this great university. We are in the house of uh, James Monroe, famous, amongst other things, for his doctrine, America for the Americans. Today, this phrase is still relevant in the sense that our most important strategic interest lay within our American continent. So look south. This morning, I went uh, with my family to Monticello. Caroline, the marvelous guy there, gave me a copy of the letter Jefferson sent to Alexander von Humboldt who led the most important botanical expedition made in the past uh, two centuries. In that letter, there is a phrase that says, America has a hemisphere to itself. And I would add, a very rich hemisphere. For example, the richest biodiversity in the world is concentrated in South America. The most uh, transformative revolution of mankind is just st starting biotechnology. <coughs> if we see each other as one, South, Central, and North America, we can all take advantage of this huge potential. This is one of the reasons why I say that the real strategic interest of the U.S. lies within our continent. So look south. That's why I have what I have recommended President Clinton, Bush, Obama, and just two days ago, President Trump. Not far from here, there is another historic house of another James, James Madison, the father of the U.S. Constitution, whose words today are also more relevant than ever. And I quote, knowledge will for forever govern ignorance. And a people who mean to be their own governors must arm themselves with the power that knowledge gives. 
your leadership must be rooted in knowledge so that you can achieve the best version of yourselves and walk confidently in the direction your hearts leads you to make a difference in the world. You will need the power of knowledge to discern and make the best decision between what is popular and what, what's the right thing to do. You will need the power of knowledge to make hope prevail over fear. The future of democracy, the future of the world, the future of humanity, your future, depend on it. So good luck and congratulations to all the graduates of 2017. Thank you. President Santos, as a token of our appreciation, we have two gifts for you. The first is very small, but it is the same <clears throat> that all our graduates have received. It is the coin that Dean Rockwell described in her notes, inscribed with your name. Thank you very much. The second gift, I understand you're a student of history. You've been to Monticello today. We have for President Santos a bowl. Now, it may look to the uninitiate as just a salad bowl. <laughs> but it is a very special salad bowl because it came from a very special tree. This bowl was turned from a tree that fell. The tree was a tulip poplar tree next to Monticello. It fell recently, and a carpenter has taken the wood to make bowls. It is inscribed on the bottom commemorating your speech. We know, though, that this, in fact, is a Jeffersonian tree. Because among many other great attributes, President Jefferson was a great chronicler of detail. In this particular tree, in this particular spot, he noted in his botanical notebooks. The tree existed in 1807 when he noted its shape, size, and location next to his house. And so, in perpetuity and recognition of our friendship, this token from the Frank Batten School to you and your country. Thank you very much. So, with, with, with this uh, coin, will I have the privilege uh, of saying I am also a Wahoo? You are a Wahoo. <laughs> 